My guest for today's episode of Sangreal is Dr. Mark Miravalle, a renowned theological expert who holds the St. John Paul II Chair of Mariology at Franciscan University of Steubenville, where he has been teaching since 1986. Dr. Miravalli is the author and editor of over 20 books in Mariology and Spiritual Theology and has spoken at numerous international conferences and has appeared on EWTN, National Public Radio, the BBC, and Fox News. He is also president of the International Marian Association, comprised of more than 130 theologians, bishops, clarity, and laity worldwide who seek to promote Marian devotion and doctrine. In the discussion that follows, I asked Dr. Miravalli about Mary's role as co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces, and why it is right and proper that we honor Our Lady with these titles. I hope you find this discussion helpful in developing your own relationship with our mother, whom Christ himself gave to us from the cross. All right, Dr. Miravalli, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to talking with you again, um, you know, uh, really diving into the topic of our Blessed Mother as co-redemptrix, and I can't think of a better person to sit down with and talk with about this, so thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's a real honor, Paul, and I, I'm, I'm just thrilled at the subject that you suggest because I think it's, um, it's so universally needed to understand what it means to be Catholic let alone the Marian dimension and, um, and perhaps under fire anew or, or at least misunderstandings anew. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be with you to discuss this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so to start us off, um, you know, let's just get to the heart of the matter. You know, can you explain what is, what is meant by the term co-redemptrix? Yeah, co-redemptrix, and let's just do a little etymology. Mm -hmm. Co is a prefix, you know, meaning with, it doesn't mean equal. Uh, trix, T-R-I-X, is a feminine suffix, uh, and it really means the woman who participated with Jesus in the redemption of humanity. Uh, the, the biggest knee-jerk, Paul, is the idea that it's uh, equal, mm -hmm. and uh, with good reason. I mean, equal means uh, heresy and blasphemy. To, to say that Mary is equal in the redemption with Jesus uh, upsets the Immaculate Heart more than any other heart. It's simply not what the word means. And we know even with liturgy today, right, we, we are co-heirs in Christ. We're co-workers with God. Well, none of that can mean equal. Otherwise, we're all blaspheming. Uh, so it means, it, it, it specifically refer, refers to Our Lady's unique participation with and under Jesus Christ in the redemption of humanity. Uh, and so you want to get past a misunderstanding of co-meaning equal. And I think that initially, you know, will help a lot of people get past uh, the trouble with the term. Yeah, and I think maybe some of it become comes from like a legacy of perhaps any Catholic thought, you know, th this desire to turn away from things like the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother. And, you know, so there's, there's probably a, a purposeful uh, along the way. And I think most people are probably pretty good natured, but along the way, just purposely try to misstate the church's um uh you know the church's veneration of our blessed mother and you know and all that kind of thing so you know my next question is really about kind of getting into the idea of co-redemption that, that participation right and so how is each of us called to be a co-redeemer or co-redemptrix by virtue of joining in christ's sacrifice and how is mary the co-redemptrix par excellence. Yeah, and it's, it is critically important that we go right to where you're bringing this conversation because <clears throat> every Christian, in virtue of being baptized, has to be a co-redeemer. Every Christian has the mission of uh, working for the salvation of others, right? So uh, I was actually speaking to a bishop in Europe uh, the other day, and I made the claim, and, and he strongly agreed that if we don't understand co-redemption, it undermines the whole nature of the church. Mm -hmm. In other words, it, it, then Jesus did everything, right? He saved us. It's, it's all done. All we have to do is receive that. And there's really no need for a medium of 
what we call the church in between. I mean, if you want to call the church something loosely, uh, the people who have received this, mm. but there's no mission to preach the gospel. There's no mission. What do you do with guys like Padre Pio? Uh, you know, guys who have suffered and continued to look for more suffering because he, he, he knew he was saving souls. So, so to get very basic, let's go to what St. Augustine says. St. Augustine says, God creates us without us, but he cannot save us without us. Mm. And that means that both individually, we have to cooperate with faith. And as James tells us, you know, it's, it's faith, hope, and charity, right? right? It's not a faith without any work. It's faith expressed in hope and charity, the theological virtues. And then it's an existential concern for the salvation of everyone. We, we want as many people possible in heaven with us. So uh, in virtue of our baptism, all of us are, uh, you know, as one author, I remember driving home late at night and I was listening to a, uh, a Protestant uh, pastor, you know, well, certainly well intended. We always assume uh, good intentions. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, you know, Christianity is like a doubles tennis match. It's, it's you and Jesus versus uh, the world uh, and the devil. And it's just a two on two. And uh, the sports analogy couldn't miss more, I think, because on our side, <clears throat> it's Jesus, it's Our Lady, it's St. Joseph, it's the angels, it's the saints, it's the holy souls in purgatory. And it's the people of God on earth versus the world, the flesh, the devil. And my point is, we as Christians must further the mission of the redemption. It's always in Jesus. It's always entirely dependent. I mean, I don't know what, modif what modifiers we could invent to say there's no use going past saying mm -hmm. Jesus is the divine redeemer upon which all redemption is dependent. Period of the sentence. End of discussion. If you want to continue that part, then you're entering some very dangerous terrain. Jesus is the divine redeemer. Having said that, Look at what and how Jesus starts his church. Look how he enters humanity. Uh, sometimes we forget that uh, God did not have to use a woman for the incarnation. As G.K. G. Uh, G., uh, G. Chesterton used to say, uh, you know, babies could be on trees. Uh, you didn't have to have the blessing of having, you know, married couples. You could, you know, pick your kid off a tree. But God wanted a woman intrinsically involved in this work. And that's why the very first image that uh, the first three centuries of Christianity had is Mary as the new Eve. Uh, many actually think, Paul, it was apostolic teaching because it was being taught on, on three continents mm -hmm. by 180, 185. I mean, how, do you, how, do, how does that happen? Uh, and you've got these direct connections between... Uh, again, the, the apostles and, uh, and, and Polycarp and, and Irenaeus coming from John. So the point is, they got it. Mm -hmm. So in one, 185 AD, St. Irenaeus says, Mary is the, quote, cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Now, that's bold. If I, if I say that on radio today, I get a couple callers uh, say, well, you know, you're, you know, you're going too far. No, that's not me. That's that second century apostolic uh, and early church teaching. So all this leads to the fact that St. John Paul II called us on three occasions co-redeemers in Christ. Okay. Now people say, well, yeah, John Paul just went over the top with that. Well, then uh, Pope Benedict went further over the top. Because Pope Benedict, when he's blessing the poor at Fatima with, with, our blessed, with our Eucharistic Lord, he says, I call you to be redeemers in the Redeemer. So we can't be afraid of analogy in our faith. And by that, I mean a word which says something is essentially the same, but also essentially different, right? So we participate in the redemption of Jesus and that's a long-winded answer to just part one. I'll, I'll be shorter with part two, mm -hmm. because how does Our Lady do that uniquely? Well, the popes tell us. Pius XI defended the title co-redemptrix mm -hmm. by saying, A, she gave birth to the Redeemer, and B, she suffered with the Redeemer throughout her life, but especially on Calvary. Mm -hmm. That's what makes her the unique co-redemptrix. 
But if the whole church are co-redeemers, which we, we must be and should be, of course, Our Lady is that, as you say, par excellence. Mm. Yeah, and I remember when we, um, when we talked last, and it's been some time ago, but I had asked you, like, when in your, your estimation was the golden age uh, of Marian teaching, and, and I believe you'd said it like the 20th century, like modern times, because of the riches of like the papal encyclicals, like you just shared, you know, Pius XII and JP II and Benedict. And, you know, the thing about co-redemptrix, I mean, it's, it's perfectly uh, aligned with the nature of love. You know, Jesus could just save us, right? But he, he desires our participation. He, you know, love is an invitation. Love is not, it doesn't force itself, right? So mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't need us. He didn't need his blessed mother, but he chose us because that's the model of love. He made us for communion. And, you know, and, and I, as I think JP2 and others have said, you know, it's like, that's how the, that aspect of communion is how we model the interior life of the Holy Trinity because they are a family right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's love in action. And so that we see that come through, you know, with, with, you know, Mary as our, our mother and the co-redemptrix and then how we model her, you know, her, her uh, aspects of, you know, perfect humanity uh, in following Jesus. Yeah. I mean, uh, when we talk about cooperation mm -hmm. or participation, mm -hmm. If we duck those terms, if, if we find them uh, unfathomable from a theological perspective, we are undermining the very heart of the church once again. I mean, the, the early fathers called grace deification. So if you have problems with, with terms being exaggerated, mm -hmm. well, let's go there. I mean, deification is to, to be made godlike. That's what happens in grace. Mm -hmm. In grace, but of course, it's by participation. We're not gods as the Mormons would hold, mm -hmm. we participate in the one grace, the Trinitarian grace that comes to us from Jesus. But then the question is, how does it come to us? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, it comes to us through, through Our Lady. Uh, Mary mediates Jesus. You know, there's a very good book uh, called uh, Mary for Evangelicals, and it's written by two Protestant theologians, mm -hmm. and very courageous, because they say, don't deny the Catholics the title of Corrie in virtue of the fact that she brings us the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. Also, don't make her a surrogate mom. Don't say that God just used her body to, to give an incarnation. Uh, that's not pleasant. Uh, you don't want to make that accusation to God the Father, that he just uses women for, for their uh, fertility, that type of thing. Uh, no, it was a free, moral, providential, predestined act that that Mary would be part of Jesus being born, of course, conceived, but also it doesn't stop there, that he, she would continue to be part of his mission, again, as the new Eve with the new Adam. So if, if we drop participation, if, if we start using, and again, I, you talked about this a little earlier, I think there's been two causes of this. One is a bit of an over-Protestantization of catholic theology where we're hesitant to say anything more than jesus is the one mediator mm -hmm. and don't say anything more well you have to if you want to reflect catholic truth you have to say more mm -hmm. but the other is just a lack of catechesis yeah. uh, i think in many cases wonderful catholics don't know that you really have to call mary a mediatrix to be true to papal teaching to ordinary magisterial teaching i mean it, Every pope from Benedict the 14th in the 18th century to P Benedict the 16th on the day he announced his resignation have taught that Mary mediates all graces, uh, have used the title mediatrix of all graces in many cases. But <clears throat> in all of this, Paul, is because of her role as the co-redemptrix. I mean, simply put, she mediates graces because she is the human being chosen by God to participate in the obtaining of graces but it's all completely dependent on Jesus. Uh, and that's why, you know, John Paul gives us a masterful explanation of 1 Timothy 2.5, which is oftentimes uh, put to Catholics by Protestant brothers and sisters. But now we're seeing, as you mentioned before, we're seeing more people in the church kind of say, well, you know, St. Paul says there's only one meter between God and man. You can't call, can't call Mary mediatrix. 
that's a big red flag uh, on a lot of on a lot of fronts. But specifically, John Paul says no. What Paul is condemning is a parallel mediation, an equal mediation with Jesus, and he should, mm -hmm. because no one is equal. But we're all called to participate in the one mediation of Jesus. Mary does it like none other. Uh, and that's why she mediates each and every grace of the redemption to every human heart that's open to it. Yeah, and I, th I think it's, it's there's a, a spirit, of, I would say a misguided ecumenism that it, you know, and I, there's a lot of commentators, I think, who, you know, have no, they're not shy about pointing the finger at Vatican II. But I, I would say that I think it's just really that the spirit of Vatican II has been um, co-opted uh, and, you know, to use that term, Protestants, Protestants says, oh, that's easy for you to say, uh, mm -hmm. there's this Protestant spirit of, you know, we, we don't want to, uh, we don't want Mary to be a stumbling block for our brothers and sisters, you know, outside of the Catholic faith. So we need to downplay her role. And, you know, so she's like the lady in the, uh, the nativity and we just pull her out, you know, for Christmas and all that. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we're really, we're at, I think at a real time where we need to stress more orthodoxy or fidelity, I would say to Catholic teaching mm -hmm. um, and not in a spirit of being rigid, but, you know, understanding and unpacking the beauty of our faith, you know, as embodied by our mother, you know? And so, you know, the, my next question, um, you know, this past Lent, I was reflecting on what I was kind of, what I was calling Mary's crucifixion. And what I mean by that, it was like, just kind of ruminating on like Mary's experience of the crucifixion. And, you know, there's, and you've said it in your series, you know, you, um, you know, you, you point to that scene where Jesus in the gospel of John, you know, he's dying on the cross and, you know, he's having a hard time breathing. Speaking is very hard for him to do. But he, he says, you know, woman, behold your son, you know, and son, behold your mother, right? He gives, you know, right before he dies, it is so important for him to give Mary to us as our mother, you know, and she's a great, great gift to us, you know, so can you speak to that and the theological underpinnings for her role as co-redemptrix? Yeah, uh, I think uh, your meditation was very fruitful uh, because it it, it's, uh, it was shared by great, great company. And that is, you know, John Paul II, again, mm -hmm. who literally said Mary was spiritually crucified with her crucified son. And her co-redemptive role didn't stop at the glorification of her son. Let's leave the second half of that for a moment and just deal with the first. Vatican II is remarkably uh, explicit about Mary's co-redemption. This is Lumen Gentium 58. Uh, the Council Fathers say that she literally consented to the immolation of the victim born of her. That means not only did she endure it, she agreed with it. She consented to it. She joined him. That's why, you know, the mystical writings of the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, St. Bridget of Sweden, uh, in the Revelations, mm -hmm. Jesus says to Bridget, my mother and I redeemed the world together as if with one heart. And then at another part, Our Lady reveals to Bridget, my son and I redeemed the world together as if with one heart. This stuff was so beautifully articulated. I mean, you could see it artistically in, in many places, but Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, his disciple Arnold of Chartres said, there, there was one single offering between Jesus and Mary. Uh, the offering was in the body of Jesus, but it happened on the altar of, of the heart of Mary. But it was one united offering, new Adam, new Eve, to repair for the sin of the first Adam and first Eve. Do, do we really have such a difficult time understanding that God in his love wants humanity involved? I mean, look, there's nothing more radical than becoming human. Mm -hmm. After that, you want to honor humanity by having it intrinsically involved in his greatest work, which is salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's why he wants all of us to continue that task. And so Marian co-redemption is her whole mission. 
I mean, imagine some, I mean, she says yes to this at the Annunciation. Uh, you say, well, wait a minute. We don't know exactly what she knew. What happens when, when, when we say yes to marriage or when a priest says yes to priesthood? Does someone come back 25 later and say, you know, are you sure you really want to do this thing? Uh, no, your, your, your yes was a yes for life. Mm -hmm. Mary's fiat was a fiat for life. She confirms it at Calvary, but she said yes to being the mother of the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. She who was educated in the temple, she who would know the prophecies of Isaiah, of the suffering servant, so disfigured that he'd be hardly unrecognizable. She knew that. She knew it. God does not ask people to say yes to what they do not know. Perhaps not in the fullest sense, but, but again, that would be abusive. Mm -hmm. He obeys freedom. And so all of this is wrapped up in the mother and again, as, as, uh, I'm so glad you keep bringing this up because if we don't get this right about her, we're not going to get right about the church um, on how we too have to be uh, saying yes to the truth that the church has brought to us. Uh, reminds me of a, a critical uh, principle of Pope Benedict XVI Emeritus, which is called the uh, hermeneutics of continuity. Mm -hmm. And it means simply, there's got to be a continuum of the theology before the council. And after the council. Why? Because the Catholic Church doesn't start in 62. It starts a little earlier, uh, 2,000 years earlier. So there can be new inspirations, new directions, new emphases, but you can't gut the doctrine that comes before the council. And this is very true about Our Lady. Uh, when you have so many popes and saints and mystics calling her the co redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, mm -hmm. and then you have John Paul II after the council who calls her co-redemptrix on seven occasions, mediatrix of all graces on eight occasions, advocate dozens of times. No one really has, as a, as a Catholic, can say, well, I don't buy that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's not only not the hermeneutics of continuity, it's not even being faithful to uh, the papal magisterium after the council. So this is simply what we believe, and, and that's, I think, uh, we have to proclaim it more because when there's lack of clarity, you need to have new proclamations. You don't put it in the dark side. You, you don't act as if we don't really hold this because we do it. And ironically, many Protestant Christians who do the research know that we know this more than Catholics do. Mm. Yeah, you know, and as you were talking, I was ruminating on the presentation in the temple, right? And Simeon tells Mary that her heart will be pierced, you know, by, by many swords. Um, I'm not quoting it quite right, but, but, you know, he, he makes that prophecy about the piercing of her heart mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and, and on its own, that would just be kind of a strange thing to just kind of add in. But if it didn't point to the crucifixion, right. If it didn't, you know, point to the immolation of the sacrificial lamb and, you know, kind of further underscore what you're saying about, you know, the Annunciation that Mary, you know, knew or, you know, kind of what she was getting into. Um, now, this, this next question might be a little cheeky. Um, I mean it with love and respect, but, you know, why do you think even marrying leaning popes like JP2 failed to define the fifth dogma? And no. the cheeky part is, you know, what's the holdup? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, have, having had the unmerited privilege of meeting with John Paul II some 12 or 13 times, um, I can say, and this will come out later when it's supposed to come out, but um, mm -hmm. he did intend to do the dogma. He even started the process for the dogma, but there was such opposition from members of the Secretary of State and other curial uh, officials mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it was a fight he did not fight all the way through. He, he had so many other fights Mm -hmm. uh, of faith that he was fighting at that time. But, um, I mean, the Holy Father uh, said, on, I just mentioned this on an occasion, and it was not to me, it was to a, a brother bishop, uh, when asked, you know, why don't you proclaim the dogma? He said, I will just convince the cardinals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and, and there was one cardinal in particular there, but I'm not, it's not important we get into that. So um, even though he did not declare the, uh, the, the, the uh, definition, um, he did everything but that. He, he laid the foundation. Mm -hmm. His teaching on marrying co-redemption and mediation and advocacy mm -hmm. is simply unequaled by any other pope in history. It's unequaled 
by 10 other popes in history. Mm. Um, it, it is such a masterful preparation. Um, there's also, and again, um, I want to be careful of speculation with, with, a, with a very good question, but mm -hmm. at, in, in the latter years of the Holy Father of John Paul's uh, pontificate, mm -hmm. um, some wonder whether it would be accepted as a valid definition because of his physical state. Mm -hmm. uh, so many were attacking him for that absolutely unjustly because he was entirely lucid. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but he did everything he could but make the definition mm. now on on the second part what's holding it up and you know let, let, let's ask the question mm -hmm. why is it so important to proclaim a dogma if these are already the teachings of the church mm -hmm. uh, i think that's a critical question uh, and the answer is because jesus always wants the truth proclaimed mm -hmm. and when it is proclaimed he answers with great graces we have ironically the example of the papacy right matthew 16 who do they say that I am? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's Simon Peter who steps up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Only then, Paul, only then do we get the papacy, yeah. right? That didn't come from you, came from the spirit, my father. Mm -hmm. And then you get the papacy. It is the history of the church that when popes proclaim the truth, mm -hmm. then there is historic grace that's released. So I believe that's exactly what Jesus wants now. He wants the truth about his mother proclaimed. I believe it's the key to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary at Fatima. Mm -hmm. And I'm not alone with that. Thought. Many, many of uh, the world Fatima leaders, mm -hmm. people like John Hafford, uh, the late John Hafford, who started the Blue Army in the United States, mm -hmm. um, Courtney Bartholomew in Trinidad, uh, Ambassador Howard D., a dear friend in the, uh, who, who is the Vatican ambassador, that suggested to John Paul II about declaring a Marian year they, because they had just done it in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. They all agreed mm -hmm. that to get to the ear of peace, to have the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, we must have this proclamation. Um, and so I think, you know, presently, I think what, what our Holy, present Holy Father did on March 25th was extremely valuable. And uh, I think he just has to go the full measure. Uh, mm -hmm. I think to proclaim a truth that Mary is, in fact, the mediatrix of all graces, the co-redemptrix of that she has these roles, only that in the order of freedom unleashes her to fully exercise those roles. Uh, without that, God doesn't force grace upon us, and Our Lady will not fully mediate until essentially we give her our fiat, right? We ask her to do so. So, uh, but... I consider the dogma, you know, people say, well, you know, why do you keep talking about the dogma? It's like, you know, a, a patient with a broken leg saying to the doctor, well, why do you keep talking about the cast? Uh, because it's the remedy. Yeah. It's the answer. And until the proclamation happens, uh, but I'll quote Mother Angelica, who she said on a live show years back where we were doing one on the dogma. She said, I don't think much good is going to happen until this dogma is proclaimed. Mm. Uh, and I agree with her. So, um, and I think, you know, we can expect miracles because whenever there's a dogmatic element, supernatural things happen to encourage the popes. Mm. Uh, you know, apart from various opinions about our present Holy Father, he's extremely Marian. He loves Our Lady. Uh, on you know, May 31st, he led the rosary uh, for Ukraine. He did the consecration on March 25th. Um, so I don't think it's out of the possibility uh, that he, he will do this. My, my ultimate concern, Paul, is that you don't want to have to wait until there's more tragedy to release Our Lady. You, you don't want to have to wait until things get worse. Um, it's almost like using, you know, Pascal's wager with the Fifth Marian Dogma. That is, okay, what if it is not the key to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary? What do we lose? by proclaiming the truth about Our Lady as the church has taught it. But on the other hand, what if it is the key to the triumph? What, it is, what if it is a condition for historic graces necessary to bring the church through a very difficult time? Mm -hmm. uh, then if we don't make this proclamation, we continue to lose souls. And I think it's a, a, a significant uh, jeopardy to both church and the world until the mother is fully acknowledged for who she is. Yeah, you know, and, and so going back, 
you know, thinking about St. John Bosco and his, his famous dream of the two pillars, you know, uh, and that the one pillar is the Eucharist and one pillar is Marian teachings and, you know, without rehashing the whole dream, you know, obviously the, the, the church is under attack and uh, the Pope in the dream lashes, lashes the ship, so to speak, to those two pillars to navigate treacherous waters you know, and we're, we're in a time where it seems that the spirit of the world has really entered the church in a big way, and I would say in a bad way, where um, a lot of like what we're trying to do with, Catholic, we're trying to downplay a lot of fidelity to Catholic teaching, you know, maybe in a spirit of fraternity is a word that gets used, but uh, it seems to be somewhat devoid of the supernatural reality. And you know, Mary is, you know, quite frankly, a big target of that, I think, because of a desire not to upset the apple cart with other Christian denominations who think we attribute too much honor to our mother, you know, so, you know, that's just me, you know, on my soapbox, so I apologize, but what would you say to those who, you know, how would you answer those who would, would claim we attribute too much honor to Mary by terms such as co-redemptrix. Yeah, well, if I can also pick up on, on your um, treatment on ecumenism here, you know, people think of them as uh, either or propositions. You're either Marian mm-hmm. or you're ecumenical. Well, the guy that started the movement for the fifth Marian dogma back in 1915, Cardinal uh, Mercier, who was a World War II, World War I hero, um, he was the leader of the church in ecumenism and ecumenical efforts during his age. Think of John Paul II. Is it conceivable that we'd have a more ecumenical pope in terms of trying to unite Christians? At the same time, it's never at the cost of true doctrine. So it's really a false dichotomy to say you're either Marian or you're ecumenical. This is the belief that Our Lady can unite Christians in ways we simply can't on our own, Mm -hmm. but we have to give it to her. And so, uh, I mean, John Paul defines ecumenism in Ut Unum Sin, saying it's prayer and dialogue ultimately seeking this union in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't hesitate to say that. Um, he even, when he goes to the World Council of Churches, he says, I invite you all to become members of the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And so the Marian dimension is seen as an obstacle to ecumenism. By some, but I and I, I don't want to be hyperbolic with this, but I think that's a real satanic victory. Mm-hmm. I think Satan wins mm-hmm. when he convinces people that his adversary, the Immaculata, mm-hmm. is the reason that Christians are united, instead of it being him, yeah. instead of he being the reason, the Diabolos, the divider, mm-hmm. the one who rejects the office of unity, which is the Pope, and instead. Uh, emphasizes what really becomes an enlightenment mentality that is an individual interpretation of scripture based on my mind not on a, not on an external authority and again that's not to say that there's the, that these are done intentionally but i think they're done ontologically epistemologically and historically that's how we got into this mess of not being one church not because of the mother because of the adversary yeah. and so um you know, the more we can see Our Lady as the means by which we get Christian unity, mm-hmm. and also simply we're not going to be ecumenical uh, consequentialists or utilitarians. We're not going to say, well, yeah, I, I will purposely downplay truth about Our Lady so we can get Christian unity. Don't go there in any case. Yeah. That's not our freedom. It's not our church. Mm-hmm. It's his church. And it's her church, you see. I mean, and and it's not for us to be able to do that. So, uh, I think there's those are misconceptions. And also, uh, with titles, remember, a title embodies a truth in one word. Mm-hmm. So the title corridemptus people say, "Well, I don't like that title." Well, oftentimes it's really they don't want they don't like the role. Mm-hmm. They don't like what, in fact, Mary did and why she deserves to be honored that way. But Jesus has a different opinion on that, and, and that's why, for example, in Fatima, he says, I want the Immaculate Heart honored alongside my Sacred Heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe that even a number of uh, contemporary apparitions have talked about 
this dogma as something that will bring true peace to the world. I mean, we have the uh, the church approved apparition of Aki to Japan, which is a, a powerful apparition, right? Talks about fire falling from humanity. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that on May 28th, uh, there was a prayer day in Amsterdam and the new bishop there uh, said, we are in the end times. Now that's a strong statement, mm -hmm. uh, but that gives a context of saying, okay, maybe we need a special shot of grace. Maybe we especially want to default towards the mother right now. Um, and not seeing her as the opposition to anything authentically pleasing to Jesus, uh, but as the means, as the maternal means by which we arrive at these victories, including the triumph of the Immaculate Heart and, and a time of peace. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting, maybe ironic, because... I, I think critics or and I, not critics like with a big C, but people who are maybe concerned about titles like co-redemptrix or say that we give too much honor to Mary, well, you know, um, it's ironic because Mary is the embodiment of perfect humility. And, you know, she, she doesn't want honors to herself simply because of herself. Any honors I think do, you know, that she would want, it's because of her relationship to Jesus. It points back to Jesus, you know, and humility is, you know, is the perfect road to heaven. And, and Mary, you know, she leads us that way to Jesus, right? And so Jesus, the Prince of Humility, you know, he wants, again, he wants all of us to participate in salvation with him in his saving work. He wants the yes, he's not a tyrant. You know, so he points to Mary, you know, as our model in humility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the closer we get, and it's a lifelong struggle, you know, the, but the closer we get to mastering, if, if you could call it that, humility in ourselves, then the closer we draw to Mary, which, you know, and through Mary to Jesus. Right. And, and, and you notice, Paul, for example, at Fatima, mm -hmm. he says, after showing the vision of hell, she says, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my immaculate heart. Look, Our Lady never sinned on earth, including the sin of pride. That's the catechism of the Council of Trent. You think she's going to start, you know, having pride issues in heaven? That's not going to happen. She's doing this all of God, for God's sake. And, and, and so sometimes when people say, well, Mary wouldn't want this title. It's like uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with your method here. Mm -hmm. This is about God. It's not about Mary. And if God wants Mary honored, that's something we should all obey. Doesn't that come from Calvary when he says, behold your mother? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, would you like my mom as your mom? Are you interested? Yeah. He says, behold her. In Latin, ecce matra tua, behold her. He's not even, he's, he's stating the theological fact. Behold, comma, your mother. She's now your mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it can be a, a bit of a... Um, a vicious circle and, 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 and even an unintended uh, fallacy to say, but Mary doesn't want more titles. This is not about Mary. This is about God wishing to honor her because we need it. Jesus wants his mother honored and we need her example. So, I mean, what's the most ubiquitous element going on right now in the world? Well, it may be suffering, right? And if that's the case, we need a model on how to do this well. We need a model on how to suffer so souls will be saved as a result. And some would say, well, yeah, you can look to Jesus, but remember, Jesus is God. I, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to suffer like him. So we can almost ad hominem Jesus. But Mary is the human person that suffers more than any human person because Jesus isn't a human person, right? He has a human nature. So Mary is our perfect model for suffering. And the, if, if we have anything that there's... Um, plenty to go around right now it's suffering we talked to the people about ukraine mm -hmm. about whether they'd rather talk about you know a, a weak ecumenism or the value of human suffering mm -hmm. um and in both cases uh they're understanding the need for our lady uh right now and and you know their great faith in our lady but um it's not about mary seeking some prideful title uh, and I'm glad that you bring that up. It's about honoring. You could say the same thing about a pope, right? 
uh, why do you go by Pope? Is it, you know, are you trying to, uh, you know, use this title uh, as, superior, as being superior over to us? And his response would be, hopefully, no, I was elected Pope. I'm, I'm, I'm acting as a Pope because that's a service to the church. So too with Our Lady. These titles are services to the church. She suffered for the church. She mediates grace to the church. She protects and advocates for the church. And by the way, they're not three mothers. There's only one mother with three functions. People say, well, it's a triple dogma. We can't do a triple dogma. No, no. We, you know, our mother suffered for us, nourished us, uh, protected us, interceded for us. We didn't have three mothers. This is one spiritual motherhood with three powerful maternal uh, manifestations as choreodentrix, mediatrix, and advocate. And again, the sooner we acknowledge it, the sooner we can experience the full intercession of them. Absolutely. So my, my last question for you is, it's kind of open-ended, but it's, you know, how can we change hearts and minds to accept this loving and beautiful role of our mother? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's somewhat uh, how, how Sheen talks about um, you know, witness has to come first. And that's never an anti-intellectual response. There's just a reality. If they don't see the peace of Christ in us, they're not going to be convinced by our theological arguments about his mother. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have to pray uh, for both the respect of truth, but also the gentleness of the mother mm -hmm. when we're talking about her. Um, baseball bats of, of Mariology will not be helpful here. Uh, I think it, it's got to be a dimension of bringing it back to, uh, you know, RCIA, for example, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, when, are we, when should we advent, uh, bring in Mary to, to a new convert's education? Mm -hmm. And the answer is right from the beginning where God put her mm -hmm. right? at the Annunciation. Make that association immediate. But if you, if you do Jesus alone stuff, for 13 weeks, and then the week before the vigil say, oh yeah, and you got to know this Mary stuff, you're setting people up for a fall. Yeah. And so uh, it's as the Father did it, right from the beginning. But I would say, starting at the incarnation, talking about the beauty of motherhood, and that God wanted a woman. I mean, even within right dimensions, authentic Christian feminism, not the radical stuff which comes from hell, the real stuff which comes from heaven which is embodied in Our Lady. Uh, it wasn't a priest, it wasn't a pope, it wasn't a bishop, it wasn't a man that cooperated with the God-man in the redemption of the world. It was a woman. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Bringing that forward, and then um, ultimately uh, trying to encourage people to pray the rosary, uh, because the rosary softens both head and heart. And um, there's a power in the, in the beads that go beyond um, just theological discourse. And so the more we can pray, and quite frankly, I think that's what's gonna lead ultimately to the Christian unity. It's not gonna be a new book, not gonna be a lecture. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a grace of the heart that allow people to accept the truth of the head. But that's gonna have to be a supernatural gift. It's not gonna be a theological breakthrough. But I think the same is true about Our Lady. Our witness of, of being, a uh, respectful to individuals who don't understand Our Lady fully, uh, and then trying to present it in peace. And then thirdly, inviting people where legitimate, where, where possible, uh, to pray the rosary, because the rosary is a creed, as Paul VI said, uh, but also uh, penetrates the human heart. Yeah, and the thing I like about the rosary, or what I'm learning every day, is it's not about reciting the beads per se, like there's some sort of magic formula or whatnot, but it's really about creating an atmosphere in your heart and your head right and so that that repetition allows you to do that so then you can you know and i do it very imperfectly but so that you can enter into those mysteries right and really get to the heart of the mother and through the heart of the mother you know to our lord and savior jesus so yeah, i think that's very important and again remember with the rosary the structure is a means to an end mm -hmm. the, the end is unity to our lord and our mother because we're meditating on their mysteries and sometimes people get uh, so uh, concerned, and of course there should be a respect for the structure, but, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's coming with a word for me to use, you know, the expressions of some on, on, on the third glorious mystery, but I don't have time for him because I got to get two more mysteries done, but, but, but he's the purpose. He's the reason we're doing this, mm -hmm. as is our Lord, as is our Blessed Mother. So um, 
announcing the mystery, but letting some freedom happen. Sometimes people say, yeah, I, you know, I, I was so distracted because I was thinking about a loved one that was that was hurt when I was praying the Sorrowful Mysteries. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's exactly what you were supposed to be thinking about so that Our Lady can help you minister to them the way she wants. So I think with the respect for the structure, there should be freedom in praying the rosary. Uh, let the mind go where it, it wants to once you've announced the mystery, uh, because that's the way a good mother tends to us too. Oftentimes it's very concrete and specific and, and, and loving. Great advice. Well, Dr. Miravalli, I really appreciate you sitting down and talking with me about this. And, you know, here's hoping, here's praying uh, that the, uh, the dogma of Mary's role as co-redemptrix and mediatrix and advocate uh, gets promulgated soon, you know, but uh, despite that, we will continue to pray and seek the intercession of our Blessed Mother uh, before the throne of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. But Thank you so much for sitting down with me today and, and having this discussion. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Paul. I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to discuss this subject. I think, again, it's, a, it's always a mind-heart uh, battle, which means it's a mind-heart victory. The more we understand these truths about the mother, the more readily our hearts want to proclaim them. And again, it's an intercessory call for our Holy Father. Um, uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. It's, it's fidelity, not success. Although I'm quite confident at one point, success will come as well. Amen. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul.